I'm going back to the story. I know how to read, so that's better than figuring out all these details. But here we go. The next morning dawned. This is bad news for the crop. Danso said when he came in from the field before breakfast, the beans need water badly. The beans that are almost ready to pick will be all right, Grandpa Manu said. He stood up and surveyed the field, but the second round to be picked will definitely be skimpy if we don't get rain. Abina set a pot of rice on the table with some sour kenke, and then she went to wake up Luami. Motumba, yawning and stretching, came to the table, and Abu was already up and trying to feed the cat some of Abina's kenke. His little voice could be heard instructing the cat in no uncertain terms that he must eat. Unfortunately, the cat didn't like the idea of being force-fed, and much less sour kenke at that. Before we start the day, let's read a scripture for morning worship, like Kossi has taught us to do, Danzo said, opening the family Bible. Here's the one I marked in my Bible when we were at Pastor Kawami's house. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. That's in Malachi 3.10 and 11, Danso added. What's a devourer, Papa? Luami asked, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Danso smiled at his daughter's serious face. A devourer is something that eats everything. Luami had such a serious look on her face but she never missed a beat, like Motumba when he eats Mama's food, and everyone laughed, and even Motumba had to smile. No, Luami, I wouldn't worry too much about Motumba. He's still growing, but we are a bit worried about some of the things that can eat up our gardens. Like grasshoppers, Luami came over and sat down on Dan Sue's lap, she still liked being Papa's little girl. Like grasshoppers, Danso agreed, putting his arms around her. They can destroy all that we have worked so hard to grow. They can invade our fields and eat our bean plants down to the ground in no time at all. He glanced toward the open Bible on the table. I guess... I guess people in the Bible had trouble with insects that could eat their crops, too. That must be what the writer meant. So, will God help us and keep the grasshoppers from devouring our beans? Luami pronounced the difficult word slowly. I hope so, Danzo shrugged. If we are faithful to pay our tithes, the Bible says it will be so. Luami looked at her papa solemnly. You don't really believe God will do that for you, do you, papa? There was a painful silence as Danzo hesitated a bit and hung his head. I think he can, he finally replied. Abina nodded. Don't forget, papa, that God has promised he will provide everything we need, no matter what. The birds and flowers don't worry about what they need. Why should we? God says all things will work together for the good of those who love him. Remember those texts? We read it in the Bible. You're right, Mama, Danzo sighed. We must trust that God will care for us and our bean crop, even if it means that God lets his grasshoppers Eat up our beans, Motumba suddenly added, a smile playing around the corners of his mouth. Denso hesitated only a moment, even if the grasshoppers eat up our beans. 
The room was quiet for a few moments longer as everyone sat thinking of what that would mean. I wish my family had had this kind of faith when I was a boy and the grasshopper plague came, Grandpa Manu said quietly. <clears throat> what did you do? Luami slid off Danzo's lap and went to stand by her grandpa. Well, we fell apart, all of us. Everybody in the village was devastated and no one knew what to do. Luami's eyes grew sad. Well, what did you do? Nothing. There was nothing we could do. All our crops were gone, eaten down to the ground. It was the hardest times for my father and mother. You could have prayed. My father didn't know how to pray. We weren't Christians. We didn't know about the Bible promises of God's protection and care. We didn't know Jesus. And my father didn't think being a Christian was important for our family. We worshipped the spirits. And you didn't know about paying tithe? No, we knew nothing of that. I think only Christians know about tithe. A great stillness filled the room. I thank God that we know of Jesus and the help he can give us, Danzo finally said. Let's pray now. And they all bowed their heads reverently. And Danzo began talking to his new friend. Lord, we are grateful for everything that comes from above. We thank you for bringing Kasi to us and the good books that have showed us your truth. Bless our bean field, I pray, Lord. We've paid our tithe, and we claim your promise that you will protect us from the devourer. Those pesky grasshoppers can destroy everything, Lord. We pray especially that you will keep them away from eating our beans. In Jesus' name, we pray our prayer, as Kasi has taught us to do. Amen. And now it's time we all get to work. Motumba, I've got good news and bad news. Which do you want to hear first? <clears throat> he frowned. The good news, because I think I already know the bad news. All right. The good news is that the beans are coming along nicely. I was out early this morning and the first crop seems to be doing well. The clay in the soil has kept the moisture below ground for the plants. Motumba half smiled. And the bad news? Well, the bad news is we need to water the plants at least one more time. Motumba groaned. It could mean the difference between a good crop and a poor one. He looked unconvinced and unimpressed. Well, the day is is still young, Grandpa Manu answered, announced. Sorry, If we get out and do plenty now, we can rest during the hard, hottest parts of the day. Maybe you can even take a swim in the river with your friends during our break, Motumba. But first, we must work. Next chapter. Motumba, Danzo, and Grandpa Manu all went outside. Little puffs of dust swirled around their feet and then rose up on the early morning air. It is sure dry, Danzu said, squinting up at the morning sky. But the wind is picking up and the sky has a eerie look about it. Maybe we'll get some rain and we won't have to water the beans after all. He threw his arm ar around his son's shoulder. It's not rained this early in the day for a long time. Abina came to stand by her husband. She too glanced at the darkening sky. It does look strange, doesn't it? Is that the wind I hear? Doesn't sound like wind to me, Motumba said. By this time, the rest of the family was out in the yard staring at the sky. What do you make of it, Grandpa? Danso turned to his father as the rising wind ruffled the leaves on the trees in the yard. It sounds more like hissing than anything else. Is that really wind? 
Grandpa, Grandpa Manu had a strange look in his eyes as he took off his pointed leather hat. That's not a storm, he shouted. It's a swarm of locusts. A swarm of locusts? Dansu turned to his father in alarm. You're kidding. I wouldn't kid about a thing like this, son. I'd recognize that sound anywhere. See that swirling, moving mass of gray over there on the horizon? He pointed north. They're coming, all right. I'd, I'd say we have about five minutes before they hit full force, maybe ten at the most. Ten minutes? Panic gripped Danzu like nothing he had ever experienced before. What do we do? There's nothing we can do except pray, Grandpa said, dropping to his knees. Abina fell to her knees too, but Danzu refused to give in. He stood staring at the sky, a feeling of hopelessness sweeping over him. There must be something we can do. He stammered, anything. We just can't stand here and let them come. They'll destroy the bean crop we've worked so hard to raise. They'll take everything. His voice rose to an angry, an angry crescendo. But Grandpa was praying and didn't answer. Abina was on her knees in the dust, and Danzil could hear her reciting some Bible verses. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Her voice was soon overpowered by the whirring wind of locusts coming their way, but she prayed on. During the previous weeks, she had come to love the family Bible and had committed to memory many verses of Scripture. Whether she was pounding corn in the wooden mortar or washing clothes or hoeing in the family garden, the Bible had come to be her comfort and joy, and now these verses were her strength. There's millions of them, Motumba shouted above the whir of the locust wings. Look at them. A strange light came into Motumba's eyes as he watched them come. Unfortunately, he was too young and too naive to imagine the devastation that was about to hit the farm. Luami, however, sensed the seriousness of the moment, and like her father, her eyes widened in fear. She clutched little Abu's hand. He appeared unafraid as he pointed at the sky, his curious little eyes watching the coming storm. By now, other neighbors had come out to look at the sky, and they began to panic and shout as they pointed at the approaching swarms. Their screams rose on the wind like the eerie wailing of mourners at a funeral for the dead. Danzu stood transfixed, as the swirling mass of gray drew nearer and nearer in the darkening sky. All will be lost, he moaned, as the whirring sound increased to a dull hiss on the morning air. His eyes darted this way and that as he tried to think of what he could do. We've got to do something. They'll devour everything. He kept saying as he lifted his hands helplessly to the sky, the entire crop will be lost. The insects kept coming on their destructive path, but above the hiss of a billion beating wings, Abina's voice could be heard. The Lord's our rock, and him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Her quavering voice sang the song they had learned just that week at church. <clears throat> Secure whatever ill betide, a shelter in the time of storm. And then the grasshoppers were upon them like a cloud of noxious vapor. They filled the hot morning air, swirling and spinning across the landscape, as if trying to decide which way to turn. It was a terrifying sight. 
Their clicking wings kept them hovering for a moment longer, and then they suddenly dropped to the field. They covered the trees along the fields, weighing down the limbs until the branches touched the ground. They swarmed everywhere upon the neighboring fields of corn and tomatoes and spinach. As they hit Danzo's bean field, they covered it like a heavy blanket, flattening the stout bean vines to the ground. Wasting no time, they set to work with their mandibles, stripping the leaves from the plant, plants, eating the ripe beans, and the beans not yet ready to pick. They even chewed on the wiry stems of the bean vines. It was a sickening sight, and it was all happening just as Grandpa had described in his stories. The army of creeping, crawling creatures moved across the field like a giant eating machine. Even the munching, crunching of their tiny jaws could be heard as they devoured the bean field that had come so close to being harvested. They're eating everything, Luami screamed hysterically and ran to her mother for comfort. Abina was still on her knees, but she pulled her daughter close as they watched the hordes of insects ravage their bean field. God has promised that he will be with us, she said in Luami's ear. He will not forsake us. We must depend on his goodness. <clears throat> Abina was frightened, too, but so far she had managed to remain calm her steady voice not revealing the shell-shocked feeling of despair that threatened to sweep over her. And then Danzu suddenly roused himself to action. We've got to stop them, he shouted it again. Come on, Motumba. There may be millions of them, but no one is going to say we didn't try. And he raced off to the shed where they kept all their tools. The two of them emerged a few minutes later with hoes and rakes and shovels. Danzu started into, darted into the bean field, now covered with a carpet of seething, moving grasshoppers. Their small bodies crunched under his feet as he ran, but he paid that no mind. With a hoe in each hand, he began swinging great arching swaths taking out bean plants and hordes of grasshoppers as he ran. Motumba followed his example with two shovels, sending plants and dirt flying. Come on, Papa, Danzu shouted at Grandpa Manu. Grab a shovel or a rake. We've got to scare them off. It's no use, Grandpa said. You can't stop them. There are too many of them. We can do this, Danzo bellowed as he continued swinging the hoe with mighty blows that seemed to shake the ground. If we all help, it will make a difference. No, no, you can't, son, Grandpa Manu called at, above the dull hiss of the locust plague. I've seen all this before, and like it or not, they will march through our field and eat everything in sight. You can't stop them. You can't make a dent in them. You can kill thousands, but millions more will come to replace them. Only God can stop them now. It was hard to hear Grandpa talk like that, as if maybe God didn't really care about their plight. After all, if God wanted, he could stop the hordes of grasshoppers couldn't he? He could prevent them from eating up the fields, couldn't he? But that was the mystery of it all. God was not stopping the grasshoppers. He could, but he wasn't. And it pained Grandpa to think that maybe the family's newfound faith had all been a sham. He had worked as hard as anybody to get this crop ready for harvest and now it seemed God had abandoned them in their time of greatest need. He was not protecting the field from the devourer, as he had promised. The old man hung his head 
surely all was lost. His face showed the agony of having to surrender to grasshoppers once again, the greatest enemy he had ever known. Danzu and Motumba beat at the relentless hordes with their tools for a few frenzied moments, but the ravenous little beast took no notice. The ferocious onslaught of tools and muscles seemed no more effective in their hands than if they had been trying to stop a herd of elephants. They worked at a maddening pace, cutting wide paths through the bean field, taking out hundreds of plants and thousands of insects in their wake. But a fresh wave of grasshoppers always fell in behind them, continuing on where the others had left off. Eventually, Danzu and Motumba began to tire. They slowed in their efforts, swinging their tools with less and less force, until they finally stopped, their hoes and shovels hanging limp at their sides. Grandpa was right. There was nothing they could do but watch the horrible tragedy unfold. The neighbors all up and down the road were out in their fields too. Some had followed Danzo's example and tried to beat back the grasshoppers that had descended on their fields, but they finally gave up too. It was no use, and their pitiful wailing and screaming reached a new level as they all realized there was no hope for their crops. There was no doubt now that the grasshoppers would eat everything. Danzo's shoulders slumped as the locusts continued their rampage across the bean field. The patch was small as bean fields go, only two hectares, hectares, five acres in size, and the insects were making short work of the beans. We're ruined. All our hard work is gone now, he moaned. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. I thought God would protect our fields if we paid our tithe, Motumba stammered. He was out of breath from the battle and his young chest rose and fell from fatigue. Why isn't he saving our fields? I don't know, son, Danzu stammered in despair as he watched the locusts feeding on their beans, oblivious to the humans who had become mere spectators at the edge of the field. Luami pulled on Danzu's arm. We've got to do something, Papa, she wailed. There must be something we can do. There's nothing, nothing we can do. He repeated Grandpa's words of resignation, nothing at all. It saddened Abina to hear Danzo's voice so full of despair. This was her husband, the one who desired more than anything to care for her and provide for the family. Now he was standing helpless before the hordes of devourers that had come to destroy everything their family had worked so hard to produce. And then, then an idea struck Abina like an epiphany out of the blue. Must they indeed stand by and let these monsters of the northern desert come sweeping in to reap the rewards for which they had worked so long and hard? Shouldn't humans be the ones in control here? After all, weren't humans superior to every other creature on earth created in the image of God? The thought of all those pesky insects eating up their hard work made her just a little bit angry, and in that moment a sudden thought pushed its way into her mind. Without a word, she rushed off to the shed, the deafening hiss of grasshoppers still loud in her ears. Before long, she was back with a load of burlap sacks in each arm. Danzu, Motumba, help me, she called out. Grab a sack. What are they for? Fill the sacks with grasshoppers, Abina shouted excitedly as she rushed. Luama, you keep 
Ab Abu out of the fields. Fill the sacks, Danso retorted, confusion written on his tired, dirt-streaked face with grasshoppers. Why? The beans are nearly all gone. What's the point? You and Grandpa said so yourself. He turned to stare at the field. Look at the bean plants. The grasshoppers are covering them like glue. There are too many of them. The plants are finished. We can't win. And it was true. By now, the grasshoppers had nearly eaten every green thing in sight. Long gone were the tender bean plants and pods, and still the grasshoppers managed to find something to chew on. But Abina seemed unaffected by her husband's arguments as she ran out into the bean patch, which was now totally decimated. Only scraggly stems of twisted bean vines remained as mute witnesses to the destruction of the advancing army. Help me catch the grasshoppers, everybody. Put them in the sacks, she called, her voice fading as she ran down the rows of what had once been healthy bean plants. Danzu looked at Motumba, and Motumba stared right back. What's she doing? Danzo asked impatiently, swatting at a grasshopper that word passed his head. I have no idea, Matumba shrugged, his face showing the same level of confusion. Maybe she's trying to save what's left of the beans. It won't do any good. Any beans left are ruined already. She wants us to help her catch the grasshoppers, Luami shouted as she grabbed her father by his hand. Dansu glanced at Luami in surprise, as if he had heard the command for the first time. Catch the grasshoppers? He turned and stared out across the field, a question mark on his face. Is that what Abina is doing? For a moment, he forgot the devastation of the grasshopper plague as he thought of Luami's words. Abina catching grasshoppers, but why? What are you doing, he called again to Abina as he hurried into the field. By now she was scooping up big handfuls of the wriggling, crawling insects and stuffing them into the sacks. I'm filling these sacks with grasshoppers, and if you're smart, you will too. She said excitedly, her face flushed and already dripping with sweat as she continued on down the row. Grasshoppers were jumping up on her arms and neck and face, but she clawed at them, shoved them into the sack along with the others. You want us to help catch grasshoppers, Danzo called after her in exasperation as he pulled more of the gangling, prickly bodies of grasshoppers from his hair and face and eyes, sorry, and ears. What for? We can't stop them. It's too late. The fields are destroyed. Viciously, he swatted at the pesky insects, now biting him for lack of something else to eat. Why they're sticking around, he couldn't say. Why they were sticking around, he couldn't say. The field of green was all gone. Surely some instinctual drive was keeping them on his farm, but it wasn't the remaining foliage. There wasn't any. Even the leaves on the trees at the edge of the field were gone. Not one remained to shake and shimmer in the hot morning breeze, and still the grasshopper stayed. Abina stopped momentarily and turned around to stare at him. The weary work-worn expression on Dansu's face clearly showed a man who had been beaten. Gone was the drive to work hard. Gone was the bean crop he had worked hundreds of hours to produce. Gone was his faith in God. God has provided a way for us after all, Abina exclaimed. He has blessed us with something we could never have expected, and we need to take advantage of it. We no longer have beans. 
Dan Su, but we have grasshoppers and we can sell them in the market. People will buy them to eat. She turned again to her work, calling over her shoulder. Just fill the sacks. We're almost out of time. If we may wait much longer, they'll all leave. Motumba and Grandpa Manu were in the field with Dansu now, following along behind. What does she want with the grasshoppers? Motumba asked in frustration as dozens of grasshoppers jumped onto his shoulders and head, clinging to him. Is she out of her mind? His patience was at an end. Maybe, but for a moment longer, Danzu watched his wife half walk, half run, stooping to the ground, her sack trailing along behind her as she worked feverishly. Motumba glanced at Grandpa Manu, but Grandpa only shrugged, wondering if Danzu might be losing his mind also. But a spark of life had now ignited itself in Danzu, and the man wondered why it had taken so long for Abina's idea to register. Maybe all was not lost. Maybe there was a ray of hope in this disaster after all. I think your mother may have something here, he squinted at the lone figure of his wife in the field. Let's do as she says, and without another word, he picked up his sack and ran along behind her. Motumba followed, shaking his head, but snatched up a sack and followed along. Strangest thing I ever did see, said Grandpa Manu, half grumbling, as he too headed out in the field. Picking grasshoppers as if they were berries, but soon he was working as if someone had lit a fire under him. Come and help, Luami, Abina yelled as she tied off one of her sacks and started filling another. Grab a sack. I've already got one filled. Eek, Luami screeched as she picked up um, the squirming, wiggling grasshoppers in her hand, but soon got used to it, and she enjoyed having Goliath. She had enjoyed having Goliath as a pet, but this was different. The family hurried through the field of leafless, scraggly vines, still swarming with the voracious eaters. Everyone was filling the sacks now with great handfuls of the huge insects, difficult though it seemed to be. It was the strangest sensation to grab up the squirming insects and push them into the sacks, already bulging with the wriggling, creeping creatures. Danzu set, set his mind to the task, clutching at the crawling, jumping locusts. Some tried to bite his hands and wrists, but he brushed them off as he plunged his hand into the sack again and again. Motumba followed the family's example reluctantly, but his heart was not in it. Chasing grasshoppers around the field as if they were toys is foolishness, he muttered to himself as he kicked at the grasshoppers jumping up his legs. It's embarrassing even, craziest thing we've ever done. But Luami paid no mind to her brother and set right to work doing her part. Soon she discovered that if she ran along, dragging the open mouth of the sack on the ground, she could scoop up the grasshoppers even faster than the grown-ups. In no time at all, she had two sacks of her own filled. The work was tiring but the family seemed to get a second wind and worked faster and more furiously now to capture the swarming insects. Abina had inspired them all, and though they had no clear concept as to where this would all lead, they worked hard to fill their sacks with grasshoppers. They were a team. It had taken them time to catch on to the idea, but once they started, like the grasshoppers, they moved across the field like a machine. For more than an hour, they worked to fill their sacks with the wriggling locusts. Everyone's back ached, and their arms grew sore, but they kept on going. Hurry, Abina kept urging them. We haven't much more time. Pray that God will keep the grasshoppers here <laughs> a little bit longer. 
<clears throat> Danzo worked quickly beside his wife, and he had to wonder now at the strangeness of it all. When the grasshoppers had first arrived, they had all prayed that God would rebuke the devourer. Now they were almost hoping God would keep the grasshoppers here a little longer. <laughs> How very strange are the providences of God, thought Danzo, as he scooped up huge handfuls of the insects. <laughs> and then Danzo felt a change in the air. It was as if the frenzied munching of the scavenging insects had stopped, as if the crawling carpet of grasshoppers with one accord suddenly grew still. Danzo's family stopped their work of gathering, sensing that something was about to happen, and then it did. Suddenly, as if by some mysterious signal sent forth, from their commanding army general, the whole locust swarm rose on, on the southerly wind. The synchronized parts of the giant mowing machine all sailed off on the morning air just as quickly as they had come. It was amazing. Within just a few minutes, there wasn't a grasshopper left. The bean field was now totally empty of plants and grasshoppers. All that remained were a few spindly bean stems that had proven themselves too tough even for the grasshopper hordes. The plants now looked for all the world like little stick men standing guard in the wide open barren field. If it hadn't been such a serious thing, it might have looked comical. Not a leaf could be seen anywhere in the nearby forest of trees either. The locust, locusts had chewed every green thing in sight, making the foliage disappear as if by magic. The plague of locusts had been a terrifying sight, and as the family stared out across the stubble that had once been a field of flourishing beans, they knew hard times were ahead. Are they gone for good? Luami finally broke the silence. I never want to touch another grasshopper in my life, not even Goliath. And then suddenly everyone started talking at once. It's so quiet, Motumba exclaimed in awe, kind of eerie-like. Grandpa started talking about how this grasshopper plague compared to the one he had experienced as a young boy. But Abina praised God. Thank the Lord it's over, she said again and again. And Danzu continued staring at the open field, a mixture of confusion and disbelief on his face. The immensity of destruction was beyond anything he had ever experienced. I would like to know now, he finally stammered, as though he had woken up from a dream, what on earth are we going to do with all these grasshoppers? Well, first of all, we need to praise God for the good times and the bad, Abina said as she tied off her last sack of squirming insects and threw it onto the pile of bulging bags. From everything Kasi and Pastor Kawami have told us, God has promised he would never abandon us. But he has abandoned us, Matum Motumba protested. Look at our fields. He pointed with a sweeping gesture at the bean field, now stripped naked of all its foliage. We have no beans. We'll have no money. What are we going to do? The pastor told us if we paid our tithe, God would rebuke the devourer. Well, they weren't rebuked. In fact, if anyone's been rebuked, it's us. Motumba, don't be so hard on your mother, Grandpa Manu said, as he laid a hand on the young man's shoulder. She's just trying to be brave and keep up our spirits. Well, I don't get it, Motumba said. 
in one of those rare moments when he seemed to forget his place. We paid our tithe. Where was God? How come he didn't protect our bean fields like the Bible said he would? You're right, Abina admitted. God didn't protect our beans. In fact, he let the grasshoppers eat every last one of them. Motumba stared at his mother, not sure what where this was going. But he did do something else for us, something none of us really expected. He gave us lots and lots of grasshoppers. Just look at them. She pointed at the pile of trembling sackfuls of worming, squirming creatures trying to get out. How many sackfuls did we get? I don't know, Motumba stared at the sacks, not sacks, not giving his mother a chance to make her point. Ten, twenty, a hundred, does it matter? <clears throat> Millions of grasshoppers eat up our beans, and you want to catch them instead of kill them? What's the point? Danzo ignored Motumba's anger. Well, let's see. I count one, two, three, four, fifteen, fifteen, sixteen. Hmm, the way... We have 23 sacks of grasshoppers. What will we do with them? Motumba kept on with his tirade. Abina smiled tiredly at her eldest son. Well, now, Motumba, we could kill them. That's an idea. But I think we'd be better off taking them to town and letting our neighbors eat them. What? Motumba looked as if he thought his mother was losing her mind for sure. Are you sh kidding? If we do that, we're likely to get a good beating. The last thing the people in town want is to see more grasshoppers. They've had enough of the pesky insects to last them a lifetime. Are you sure about that? Abina said. Danso finally cracked a smile and then began to laugh at the look in Motumba's eyes. Dirt streaks traced the rivulets of sweat now pouring down his face. Think, my boy, father said, the light of faith coming finally into Danzo's eyes. What do people around here do with grasshoppers? What are you talking about, Motumba asked. They hate them. They want to get rid of them. Well, they eat them, Luami said, as she stepped up beside Motumba, her little face, the picture of simplicity. They cook them, they roast them, they sell them in the marketplace. We see that all the time we go to town, Motumba. No one said a word. Instead, they watched Motumba's impatient face change from a mixture of surprise and embarrassment to wonder and excitement, as if he had suddenly stumbled upon the greatest discovery of his life. Danzu nodded with a touch of shame himself. She's right, Motumba. People around here eat grasshoppers. In fact, we've eaten them ourselves, so it makes perfect sense. He turned to Abina respectfully, and we owe it all to your mother. She was the only one who didn't crack under the pressure. She was the only one who didn't panic. If she hadn't come up with this idea, we would be standing here staring at our barren field with nothing to show for it. Grandpa Manus grunted and then began to chuckle. I never would have believed it. In all my born days, nothing has ever taken me by such surprise. The whole thing was staring us right in the face and we couldn't see it. You saved the day, Abina. She smiled sheepishly. sheepishly. Oh, now, stop making such a fuss. God is the one who deserves the credit. I just acted on inspiration. I don't know what made me think of such a thing. I guess I just saw all those grasshoppers climbing and crawling over one another, and it reminded me of all the heaps of grasshoppers we see in the roasting pans at the market in town. Everyone was smiling now with the moment of crisis past, but Motumba just stood looking at the field in silence. I really feel bad, he finally said. 
I guess I gave up on God. In a matter of minutes, I gave up my faith and stopped believing in all the things we've learned in the past few weeks. He still looked bewildered, but he seemed more disappointed in himself than anything else. It's all right, Mutumba. God has blessed us, and that's what really counts, Abina said. She put her arm around Motumba, and this is going to turn out to be a blessing for people in town, too. It's not likely that anyone else will have thought of this. <clears throat> they were all too worried about their crops, but now they'll have something to eat. Danzo hung his head to Motumba. I know how you feel. This has been hard on all of us, and I have to confess that I've not been a good example for the family this day. He scuffed the toe of his sandal in the dirt. I doubted God. I doubted he would provide for us, that everything would work out for the best. We wanted God to give us a bean crop so we could sell it. But God gave us 23 bags of grasshoppers to sell at the market instead. And hopefully they'll make up for the bean crop we've lost. <clears throat> the grasshoppers are not beans, he added matter-of-factly, but people eat them, and God knew there would be less food now that the grasshoppers have destroyed our crops. In the end, he has provided a way for us to get some more money and a way for the village to have some food. God always works out everything for the best. Danzu stared up into the bright haze of the morning sunlight. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Just like our new book says, even the grasshoppers, he added, his grimy, dirt-smeared face cracking a smile to those of us who trust him. He will provide. He won't fail us, just as he has promised. He stared at Abina, a look of determination in his eyes. And you, my wife, have again shown us what's really important, faith in God's promises. He put his arm around her. Hard work is necessary, but trusting in God and his goodness is what really matters. I never want to doubt God like this again. Motumba said as he stared at the wriggling, bulging sacks of grasshoppers. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but he always surprises us because he always has the last word. He picked up a sack of grasshoppers and raised it to the sky. When we least expect it, God blesses us in ways we could never guess possible. Blessed be the name of the Lord. With the whole ordeal over, they took their grasshoppers to market, and what a sight they made as they toted the 23 sacks of locusts piled high on a two-wheeled cart. It was quite a load, and it was all they could do to keep the bulging sacks from toppling onto the roadway all the way to town. The whole family followed the old ox as it pulled the cart. Motumba guided Suki, while Danzo and Grandpa steadied the wobbly load. Abina followed along behind with Abu. Luami skipped ahead as usual, her eyes and ears open for the little bugs and creatures of God's great big world. The road to town, which had been recently bordered by green fields and towering what? trees. Are you listening to the story? Okay, I hear you, Winnie. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. Back to this to this um, story here. The road to town, which had been recently bordered by green fields and towering trees, now stretched ahead in ruins. It seemed hard to believe that just a few hours ago, palm trees and fields of corn had been growing here. Now it was all just a memory, stripped of everything living, stripped, stripped of every living thing that had once been their covering. The fields lay naked as trees pointed to the sky like bare-boned skeletons. 
It seemed as if every bird and animal had deserted the area for lack of food or cover. The village folks stared at them as they came into town. What could Danzo and his family be doing? Were they moving away? It looked as if their cart was piled high with belongings, and no one could really blame them for leaving. The countryside was all tattered and torn after the grasshopper plague. But when Danzo stopped the cart in the street for a rest, someone noticed that the bags were moving. The children were the first to see it. They stared at the sacks in wonder and then began pointing excitedly. There's something moving in those sacks, they shouted, and a crowd began to form around them. As Motumba had predicted, some looked angry when they saw the sacks of grasshoppers. And why shouldn't they be? The ins insects served as a reminder of the horrible plague that had just annihilated the countryside. Why on earth would Danzo and his family be bringing the horrid things into town? However, when Danzo told them the grasshoppers were food, the worry lines on many faces began to relax, and some even smiled. There will be little to eat until we can raise another crop, Danzo said encouragingly, so we'd like to help. We're selling these grasshoppers by the kilo to anyone needing something to eat, and the price will be fair. Just bring your large pots and pans to the market. We'll be roasting them there. When they reached the marketplace, people stood around watching, some even even offered to help unload the grasshoppers. Here was a ready supply. Um, why hadn't they thought of this? They could have all collected grasshoppers and made some money as Danzo's family was doing, but it was too late. The grasshoppers were gone, along with their cash crops and food supplies. Danzu set several large cauldrons on the ground and filled them with water. Then Motumba built fires under them. When the water was boiling, everyone dumped huge handfuls of the hoppers into the water for a few seconds to kill them. Then they roasted them in shallow pans open, over open fires. The result was ten, tens of thousands. You know, it's hard to imagine this, but anyway, the result was tens of thousands of crispy grasshoppers ready to eat. The only thing people had to do was pull the wings and legs off the insects before popping them into their mouths. And I know it's 7.57 just about, but I have one, two, three, four, a half page left of this chapter, so I think I'll read on. And of course, the Bible did not forbid such a thing. Danzo felt good about this latest business venture because grasshoppers were among the food items in the Bible that God mentioned people could eat. Sure enough, by the end of the week, Danzo and Abina had sold or bartered away every grasshopper, and they did quite well. In fact, the sale of the grasshoppers brought in more money than they could have earned by selling their beans in the market twice as much money they estimated. It was an amazing finish to a totally devastating disaster. But there were more benefits for the people of Bamboo Zuga than just grasshoppers to eat. Because of the circumstances, Danzo and Abino got to share their newfound faith with sincere village folks who were searching for truth the story was told again and again about how God brought Kosi to them and about the books that had changed their lives. The effect was amazing. Even in this time of disaster, there were those who were led to see that God's hand is over all his creatures and that he wants to bless and care for his children. Kosi or Kasi soon heard the story through the grapevine, the news about a family in northern Nigeria who had harvested grasshoppers instead of beans was everywhere. He and Pastor Kawami came to see the desolate community and to encourage the families. 
What a disaster, Pastor Kawami whistled as he stared out across the field on Danzo's little farm. Those little creatures ate everything. Not a green thing is left in the area. What will you do? We'll plant again soon, Danzo smiled, but for now we'll just pay off all our debts and put some of the money away for the children's schooling. And we'll buy Motumba and Luami shoes, Abina added. It will be the first shoes they've had in a long, long time. And that's where we'll stop the end of that chapter. Okay, well, it's 8.01. And we can um, have closing prayer then. And I'm, I'm looking ahead. That sounds like the end of the story. But it goes on. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, we have two more pages to our story. And then we start another story in the book. But let's have prayer now. I said too bad that we couldn't finish it all up tonight. But we'll finish it up next time. Lord willing. Father, we do thank you that you... You take care of us, and in ways that we may not expect or even desire, but when we have um, hindsight, we can look back and know that it was the best. So please, Father, as the night approaches for most of us, give us a good, safe, uh, restful night. Be with those concerns that we carry on our hearts, and we ask that you will intervene in each one. Um, that you will bless and keep us and our loved ones and continue to provide for us. We know troublesome times are ahead. Please guide us in all things I ask and be with each one who has joined us this night. In Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, Thank you. yes, you're welcome, Shaka. Until we meet again, may God bless and bye -bye. keep you and keep, okay, bye. Bye, everyone.